welcome back to Steel Design. Um, before we get started into announcements, there was a quick question on homework. What was that? Problem two. Problem two. Yeah, it has like a point load, a distributed load, and then another point load, but you know the point loads are at different locations. Yes. Do we analyze by channel for beam in three sections of a point load at the middle, point load at the end, and then the point load, I mean a distributed load? No. What I would do is this. Now, you can use the formulas that are in 322, but here's the beam. And then you have a load here, a load here. My advice is to just draw the shear diagram and draw the moment diagram and take the worst case scenario moment. And I'll go ahead and tell you what it's going to look like is you're going to have a really sharp decline and then it's going to kind of do something like that. Um, and so you're going to use that maximum moment. Now, if you don't want to draw the moment diagram, you can just take the worst case moment there. But you're not going to use different moments at different points. Because if you have a cantilever beam like this and you're bending it, the worst case moment is going to be where your hand is. Does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that answer? Okay. One point I'll mention about homework eight, and this is for, because there's a couple of you that haven't had concrete design. There are statements in the homework assignment that state that the load, the live loads are already reduced, or it states something about live load reduction. If you haven't had concrete design, just ignore that. Just ignore it. If you've already had concrete design, you know what I mean in terms of live load reduction. Just assume that those are already reduced. In other words, if you've had concrete design, you've already done live load reduction, I'm not making you do it again. And if you haven't had concrete design, I'm not going to make you responsible for something you haven't seen. So, does that make sense? Okay. All right. Um, did that kind of answer your question about the homework? Yeah. Give it a shot. Keep in mind, the homework isn't due until Wednesday, and we'll have uh, uh, time on Monday to ask questions. Which, by the way, keep in mind, Monday's the last day before the homework's due, so make sure that you've given it a one or If you have any questions, take a look at it. I would take a look at it because there are some you know, tributary area problems and things like that, so just make sure that you're aware of that. Okay. Um, now, I left the lights on for a second because I wanted to put something on the board real quick, but before we do, a couple of announcements. So you have homework eight due on Wednesday. Uh, the last homework due the following Friday. Now, um, a uh, couple other uh, logistical announcements. First off, 452. Um, while I was gone at the uh, conference I was at this uh, earlier this week, I sent some emails to get some folks registered for 452. The vast majority of you that are eligible for 452 should be in there. If you're not, there's one of, primarily one of two reasons that you're not in 452. A. Uh, you didn't get a chance to register for 451, and we're currently working on getting the capacity bumped up to 450 so you can register for that. So if you need to get into 452 and you're not, and the reason is project management. Once you register for project management, go see Lee, tell her your name, tell her that you know why you couldn't get into 452 because it's project management, sign the form, and you'll be in. That's no problem. The other reason is that there's a couple of you that weren't uh, allowed to register for Capstone because you were overloaded. Like that would put you at over 18 hours. If that's the case, just go see Lee. There's an overload form, requires a couple signatures, you'll get in. So that's not a big deal as well. Okay? Everybody okay with that? I wanted to make sure everybody was clear on that front. Sound good? Any questions? All right. Now, last time, I, you'll see why I left the lights on because I kind of wanted to put a couple things on the board. Last time, we had a lot of calculus, a lot of different cues, and, and I know that I know that, that students kind of kind of sometimes gloss their eyes over when they see a bunch of calculus. So what I wanted to do was I kind of wanted to show the big picture with steel beams. Okay, so if you have a beam that's
that's continuously braced, what is its moment capacity? I hope you can answer that because you have homework on it. <laughs> Come on. If you have a beam that has LB is zero, what is its MN? I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to go. It's MP, the plastic moment. I had the coolest slide ever with the animation. I'm sad now. <laughs> I know it's been a while since we've looked at this stuff, but but come on now. That's a great spot. Yes, it was. <laughs> All right. So so for continuously braced beams, or LB is zero, right? We know that its moment capacity is MP. Do we know that? You knew. Sorry, I did know that. I okay, I was uh, about to say. But what we don't know is for discreetly braced beams. <clears throat> So where LB is zero. We don't know what's going on here yet. Now, in general, I want to see if you all have been paying attention. Do you think that the capacity for a discreetly braced beam is larger than MP? Or do you think it's smaller than MP? Well, let me ask you to you this way. Discreetly braced beams include things in compression that are braced. What do things in compression like to do? There we go. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you again. Which do you think is stronger, a beam that's fully braced or one that's braced at discrete points? The fully braced. So do we think that discreetly braced beam, do we think that this is going to be smaller than MP or larger than MP? There we go. That's what I like to see. Okay. So, ultimately, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and develop a curve that looks something like this. We're going to have moment capacity on this axis, and we're going to have the unbraced length on this axis. Okay? Now, before we show anything about this curve, there's a couple things that we already know. This point right here, which is where LB is zero, is going to be that. The capacity is going to be MP. Okay? That's the first thing that we know about this curve. The second thing that we know about this curve is that as this value gets larger, what should happen to the curve? Well, if we go out this way, there's three things that can happen. It can either remain constant, it can go down, or it can go up. So you tell me, do you think the curve's going to go up, do you think it's going to go down, do you think it's just going to remain constant? Who says up? Can you restate it? It's, it's, it's going to be greater than MPC yet. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. What's the condition to get if what happens? If this gets larger, if, <clears throat> keep, keep in mind, what is LB? LB is the distance between your braces. That's how far apart your braces are. So if that distance gets bigger, what happens to the capacity? It gets smaller. So the curve should go up, flat, or down? Down. Down. There we go. Okay. Now. What it actually ends up looking like doesn't really matter right now. I'll go ahead and show you that it kind of does like that whole thing. 
doesn't really matter right now. We'll completely define that later. Okay? We will completely define that later, but it doesn't really matter right now. What we need to talk about now is something that I've been teaching this class for a long time, and there's one thing about discreetly braced beams that gets students, and that's this term called C sub B. Okay? And so let me explain what's going on with C sub B. Okay? Now, we did a bunch of math, did a bunch of diffy Qs and all, all this hullabaloo. You know, I'll go ahead and turn the lights on a little bit. We did all this diffy Q and hullabaloo, and we arrived at that. Okay? Now, I don't expect you to remember every single thing about that computation. I don't expect you to start re-deriving or start breaking out the plus transforms or anything like that. But I do expect you to kind of understand the approach. And one of the things that I said in that derivation is that we were dealing with what's called a linear differential equation. Now, a linear differential equation means that we're assuming everything that isn't a variable in that equation is a constant. So it's derivatives with constant coefficients. And the big thing that we assumed constant was the moment we were applying to the section. So we're taking this beam and we're bending it with some applied moment. We're trying to figure out what is that moment that's going to cause it to buckle. Well, in our derivation, we assumed that moment was constant. Well, that doesn't really happen in reality. This would be a beam that has constant moment. But really, we, got, we tend to see beams that look a lot like this, where the moment changes, where the moment here is different than the moment here, and different than the moment there. So, unless we're dealing with a situation that looks like this over here on the left, which is incredibly rare, our differential equation and our solution doesn't work as is. We need to adjust it, okay? Well, if you open up the spec and you look at the difference between what we derived and what's in the spec, there's this little pesky term here called C sub B. That's what C sub B does. C sub B modifies our capacity to account for this. It accounts for the difference between the uniform bending that we assume to make the math as easy as possible versus what you actually get when you're designing real world beams. That's what C sub B does. Okay? Conceptually, does that make sense so far? Does everybody understand that this is an example of non-uniform bending? The moment here is not the same as it is here, not the same as it is here. Everybody okay with that? Okay, now, the big question though, well, I'm just curious as to what your thoughts are. Let's take C sub B. Generally, I'm just curious, do you generally think that C sub B values are bigger than 1? Or do you think they're smaller than 1? Who says small? But don't be shy. I see some folks. Come on, if you don't you think it's small, raise your hand. Who says bigger? Okay. Why'd you say small? Our shear factors are usually smaller than one. Shear factors? Like the point six and seven. You're saying like the resistance factor is not so you're saying that it's a safety factor. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm really not. This affects your grade. Usually in the past, usually it's less than one. Okay. All right. You said, I heard you, do, you said it has to be bigger than one. Why? Because when you look at the equation, you've got your maximum moment divided by moments at your quarter point, your midpoint, and your three quarter points. Well, so you're, you're skipping ahead of the, looking at the equation. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of cheating, but I, I, <laughs> let's take let's take the equation and how about this? The equation could be wrong, and the equation that's in the bridge spec completely different. And another thing, there's we could have negative values. Let's let's decide let's decide. Let me explain first off. The answer is that C sub B values tend to be greater than or equal to one. Okay. Let me explain why without doing a bunch of differential equations, okay? And without cheating and looking at the equation. Well, we were confident. What? We were confident. 
Okay. Listen, listen. A lot of people, when they first see C sub B, they think it's a safety factor. And it's, it is um, natural to think that, but it's not. Okay? C sub B, again, its purpose is to modify our capacity to count for non-uniform bending. Now, but that still doesn't answer the question, why are C sub B values bigger than 1? Right? Let's be clear what that means. When I say a C sub B value is bigger than 1, I'm saying that we compute the capacity, and by accounting for this, the capacity goes up. Like, why do beams get stronger when we account for this as opposed to ignoring it? Well, if I take a beam, let's take the case on the left. If I take a beam and I twist it at the ends, this is what the moment diagram looks like, right? In order to buckle that beam, I have to reach that critical buckling stress everywhere. However, over here, I don't have to buckle the entire beam. I only have to hit that critical buckling stress right here at the top, or right here at the middle. So I propose that not using C sub B unfairly penalizes a beam. In other words, you're expecting that that beam has to develop its full strength everywhere. But that's not really the case. If I have a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load, I only need to develop its maximum capacity right here in the middle. And that's what C sub B does. It takes into account the fact that the bending moments are non-uniform. Okay? And so as a result, when you use C sub B, your capacity tends to increase. Yes? What is FCR? FCR. FCR is the elastic buckling stress that this, that this thing hits when it LTBs. And let me say one other thing about FCR and about this equation, just, just so you're aware. Okay? Watch this. In a few slides, I have a nice plug and chug, step by step, how to compute capacity. Don't worry. I know there's a lot of details that I'm throwing at you. I break it down in a very, very basic, easy to digest set of equations here in a bit. We got plenty of examples that'll go through how to do this. Don't worry. I won't leave you hanging. We got plenty of time. Everybody okay with this? So is everybody okay with the idea that C sub B tends to increase the capacity because by, by not accounting for it, you'd be unfairly penalizing the beam. You'd be requiring the beam to develop its capacity everywhere when that's not really the case. It really only needs to develop capacity at the worst case scenario. Everybody okay with that? Now, what C sub B stands for, like what it's called, is a moment gradient modifier. And so it's kind of a measure of how much your moment changes. And so as soon as I say that, you start thinking about change and rate of change, you start thinking about slope. Well, is the moment gradient modifier the same thing as the slope? The answer is no. It's kind of related to the slope, and I can go ahead and tell you that if you have moment diagrams with high slopes, you tend to have high C sub B values, but it's not necessarily one-to-one. -one. It'll give you an idea as to which segments have the larger C B values and which one have the smaller ones, but don't worry, we got a very in-depth example uh, explaining that. Now, here's the equation for C sub B. And this is, by and large, the one equation that I'm going to be focusing on today. Okay, so this is a very basic plug and chug expression for determining C sub B. I would also argue it is the easiest expression for C sub B that you're ever going to find. The one in the bridge spec, I don't think is harder, but I think the specs and the little nuances make it a little more confusing. Um, by and large, this is a very, very basic example. So let me explain how it works. Okay. So you have some beam, and it's got you know, support here, it could have a support here, it doesn't really matter, and I've got some load on it, I, I don't know, what have you, it doesn't really matter. Okay, and so what do you do? You sort of you know, draw the shear diagram, and then you draw you know, whatever, whatever the moment diagram is, it doesn't really matter. Okay. Now let's say you have a brace here and here. Every bracing segment is going to have a unique C sub B value. 
And so what you do is you take that bracing segment, let's say here and here, and you say, okay, here's that bracing segment, and I split it up into quarters. Okay, bless you. So we'll have a point here, say a point here, and a point here. We'll call that MA, call that MB, call that MC. Okay? Now one thing about this expression, I named it from left to right. It actually doesn't matter if you name it from right to left. Because if you look at the expression, MA, you multiply by 3, add it to everything. MC, you multiply by 3, you add it to everything. So it doesn't matter if I call this MA and this MC or vice versa. I could call this MC and I could call this MA. We need an MA, uh, an MA, an MD, and an MC, and we need one other value, Mmax, the absolute maximum moment, bending moment that we get along a, a single segment. It could be within the segment, it could be at the ends, it could also be one of these values, it could be anything, okay? The MA, the MB, the MC, and the absolute maximum moment that you get across that entire segment. Another thing about C sub B calculations, these four values are always taken as absolute values. So if you have positives and negatives, you always take the absolute value. Okay? So the example that we're going to do today is going to go back and flex our structural analysis muscles. That's the goal for today is to go back to CE312. Because you kind of need to know that stuff in order to be able to compute C sub B values. All right? Is everybody okay with this? Okay, I got a pretty explicit example looking at C sub B. This is a structural analysis example. If I've ever seen one, we're going to go right back to 312 land. So it's going to be kind of a review. Again, I've been doing this for a long time. And what trips students up about C sub B is this stuff. It's really not that bad. Okay, but we are going to flex our structural analysis muscles. Now, all these loads are factored. They're all... You know, dead loads, live loads, all been factored. We just got to do some structural analysis. Now, this is a beam that is braced at A, B, C, and D. So for those of you that have been paying attention, how many C sub B, uh, C sub B values exist for this beam? Three. There's three segments that are unbraced. Each of those segments has a unique C sub B value. So let's see if we can check that out. Now, how am I going to do this problem if I need a moment diagram? What, what number is this, for example? 22. So, help me out. I want to draw the moment diagram. Tell me what to do. Y'all know how to do this. I know you know how to do this. There we go. So, let's sum moments at A. Bring it back. So, we've got 40 times 15. We've got what is that? 3 kips per foot times 30 foot. So I can idealize that as 90 kips and that distance as 15 feet. So that's 90 kips at 30 feet. And so that's going to be matched by a C sub Y going up at 30 feet. Are, are y'all with me on this? Am I going too fast? Somebody tell me what C sub Y is. Say it again. Going up. Do I have a second on that? So 110 going up. So if I got 40 going down and I got 90 going down, that's 130 going down, 110 going up. Let's see, what's A sub Y? 20. Okay. 
Am I okay? Is that too fast? All right. So. First off, the shear diagram, factor shears. So tell me what to do. Start off at zero, then what? Go up 20. What about between A and B? Flat. What do I do here? Go down 40. That puts me at minus 20. What do I do between B and C? What's the shape? Is it a curve? What? So it's a line, linear. So if I'm at 20, how far, like how much do I go down? Like what's the change? 3 times 15 is 45. So if I'm at 20, go down 45. What's that put me at? Minus 65, is that a fair statement? Then I jump up 110, which puts me where? Forty-five. So that's forty-five. And then that's gonna bring me down to zero. And what's that gonna look like? Linear. How are we doing? Now what do I got to do to draw the moment diagram? Come on guys. There we go. Not letting you off the hook on this one. So, we'll call it from left to right, region 1, 2, and 3. What's the area under region 1? 300. So that's positive 300. What about region 3 over there on the right? What's the area? 45 times 15 divided by 2. Is it a triangle? Plus 337.5, right? What about the area in the middle? We can take the average of these two and multiply it by 15. What is that? That's a check to make sure that we did everything's right. If we compute the area. Well, I meant like take the area of the square, add it to the area of the triangle. Well, that, that too, yeah. I thought you were just adding those two and saying what could be negative. You could do that, but you wouldn't get that independent check. So you got 637.5? Yeah. Okay. All right. So 637.5. Okay. All right. So... Let's draw this moment diagram. We'll start at zero. Tell me what I do between A and B. Linear up to what? 300. So, okay, I'm going to draw something that I didn't do in structural analysis, but I want this to be very clear. Linear. That's really important. In fact, here, let me, let me move that though. Let me put this down. Linear. Okay. Now, if I'm at 300 and I go down this much, that's going to put me at what? Negative 337.5? Right? This is minus 337.5. And this will bring me back up to zero. Now, what does the shape look like from here to here? It's parabolic. 
do we do option? Everybody watch up here. Watch up here. Do we do option A or option B? B. A little to a lot. A little slope to a lot of slope. So it should go like that. Now, the last segment. Is it going to be parabolic, curve, linear, what? What? Parabolic. Okay, so do we do option A, option B? A, lot to a little, so it should go like that. Okay, so that's linear, this is quadratic. So when I say, so linear segments are going to be the easiest to deal with. The quadratics are going to be kind of tough. How many C sub B values did we say we needed to compute? Three? So we're going to have a C sub B for segment A, B, segment B, C, and C, D. Which one do you think is the easiest? A, B. All right, let's, let's take segment AB. Here's what we do. I want everybody to watch up here, okay? This is important. All right, here's segment AB. We split this up into quarter points. So right here, halfway between, halfway between. What's that value right there? If it's a line. 150. So what's this value right there? What's that value right there? There we go. So, okay. So let's segment AB. We have MA is 75. MB is 150. And C, 225. And for those of you paying attention, what is M max in segment AB? 300. 300. The absolute maximum moment inside that segment. So C sub B is a fraction. The denominator is 2.5 M max plus 3 MA plus 4MB plus 3MC, and the numerator is 12 and a half, 12 and a half, 12 and a half M max. So I'm not going to plug and check. I think you have the values. You can do that. What are we getting for C sub B? Keep in mind it's units, moments over moments. That's 
the easy one. Let's do the hard ones. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the hardest segment, quote unquote hardest, is the one that's in the middle. Okay? Because there's a lot more going on. I'm going to next take this segment C sub D. Okay? This segment C sub D has a zero bending moment over here, and it's got some value over there, and I know it's quadratic. So I wager that I can develop some expression m of x equals something x squared, like a parabola. So what I'm going to do is this. Because I'm not trying to like be super consistent like with what we do with virtual work. I can keep this pretty simple. So I'm going to set my origin right here. So this is x equals 0 all the way over here to x equals 15. And then what I'm going to do, if you remember one thing that we always did with moment functions, is we cut a section and we always look towards the origin. Okay? So I'm going to cut a section, samurai sword or lightsaber, and look this way. Okay? So for segment C sub D, We're going to deal with the following section. So there's the beam. Here's that lateral brace coming in at D. This dimension here is x. Let's see if y'all remember how to do this, right? So what's the magnitude of that load? What is it? Three what? Three kips per foot. So if I collapse that into a single point load, that's 3x, and that moment arm is x over 2. Y'all remember that? So ultimately what I'm after is that moment inside the section. So I sum moments at the cut. So I've got m over here, 3x times x over 2 here. So m plus 3 over 2 x squared equals 0. m equals minus 3 over 2 x squared. Y'all remember that? How do we test to see whether or not this equation is right? Is there a moment value that we know from the moment diagram? Well, zero, that's, that's a good point. If you plug in x equals zero, you get zero, right? Well, what, do you, what should we get at x equals 15? Negative 337.5. What happens if you plug in x equals 15? Well, I'll be. So, exactly right. So that's a test to see whether or not we're doing this correctly. So now we have an equation. This equation here, if I scroll up to my moment diagram, that is the equation of this curve. See, I'm going to erase that, and I'm going to say that this curve, m, is minus 1.5x squared. That's the equation of that curve. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that expression, and I'm going to determine quarter point moments. So I'm going to determine a moment right here, a moment right here, and a moment right here. So what are my x values? So this is... Seven and a half. This is what three point seven five, and that's what I'm doing the math right. Eleven point two five. I did that right. I'm asking you. So tell me what we're getting for these three moment values. Eleven point two five. 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 Eleven
That's a good question. It doesn't matter. If you want to call this moment A or call that moment A, it doesn't matter. Because look at what happens in the equation. Whether I call, like if I just call this moment C and call that moment A, I'm not doing anything differently. Because think, if I factor the 3 out, I'm just doing 3 times the quantity MA plus MC. So it doesn't matter which is which. So if you want, we can call that MA and call that MC since we're, our equation's going that way. It doesn't really matter. So, does anybody have a value for that one right there? Minus 21.1. What about the next one? Somebody else? 84.4, we'll say. What, what about the next one? Anybody? I hear them calculators clicking away. Remember, they're going to decrease more as you get away. This is a quadratic expression. That difference between them, so that's 20, that's 60, that's like 120. It's going to get big because it's quadratic. Okay, so we have, we have an MA. What do we have? Minus 21.1, MB, minus 84.4, and MC equals... Minus 189.8. Anybody have a problem with these? Well, we need an M max, but we take the absolute values every time. So plus, plus, plus. Which leads to a question, what is the value for M max? Because numerically, if you looked at the moment diagram, the maximum value numerically is zero. Because they're all negative, but that's not the case. We're talking about maximum magnitude. So what is the maximum magnitude bending moment on segment CD? 337.5. So, Plug and chug and tell me what you get for a C sub B value. I will go ahead and tell you it is larger than what we got last time. Because the moment gradient is different. In fact, it changes a lot more. Between point to point, you have a, a much steeper change in bending moment. 2.33. So if I go up to my moment diagram, what do we have? We have a C sub B, 1.67, C sub B, 2.33. Typically, we take C sub B values to like two decimal places, two or three, something like that. Okay, so the last thing remaining is this segment. Now, what I'm going to do for this segment is I'm going to see if I can continue to use the origin over here and just cut a section and look this way. And I'm going to show you a little trick that I'm going to do to make this a little easier. This is BC. So here's the segment. Now, we still have that 3x and that distance x over 2, it like didn't change. The only difference now is what's different on this section cover? What am I missing? C sub y. What is C sub y? 110. And that is about right here. And what's that moment arm? Ooh, 
in the this di that's a good point. This distance is 15. 15 minus x. No. X minus 15. Think here. The x is, so if I cut the section over here, x is like 20 something. This is 20 minus that. So make sure you get the subtraction right. Now, this is x minus 15. Now watch this. You're all like this. Instead of rewriting moments, watch this. My internal moment is going to be the same contribution from that. But watch this. See how my moments, like, remember how they sort of like went down and then they're like going back up? Well, they're going down because this is negative. So that where they're going back up, I'm going to add a term. And I'm adding 110 times x minus 15. Now, if you don't believe that works, you can sum moments and develop the equation, but it's going to be the same thing. And if you further don't believe me, what happens if you plug in x equals 15? Bear with me. What happens if you plug in x equals 15? This is 0. What do you get here? Negative 337.5. What happens if you plug in x equals 30? Let's check and see. Three hundred, right? So look, look at our moment diagram. At x equals fifteen, negative three thirty-seven point five. X equals thirty. We get positive three hundred. Does that make sense? Again, if I went too fast there, just some moments at the cut and write it out. I mean, you know, we have moment going that way, three x x over 2 going that way, and we have 110 x minus 15 going this way. It doesn't matter. Is everybody with me? Am I going too fast? All right. Now, okay, we got to do our quarter point moments, so do I put in like 7.5, 3.75, and 12.25? I don't do that, do I? What do I put in? There we go. So we have at x equals 15 plus 3.75, x equals uh, 15 plus 7.5, and x equals 15 plus 11.25. So for each of these, what are we getting for, for the moment? Does everybody see what I'm doing here? It's going to be MC, B, Say it again, negative. 114.84. All right. We'll go ahead and leave the signs as they are, like leave them negative, and I'll draw them on the, the diagram here in a second. I'll probably, I'm just going to call this 114.8. I'm just going to round it to the template. Yes? So those x values you use because those are halfway in between that second segment, right? Yes, yes. So, so watch this. So this is x equals 0. This is x equals 15. This is x equals 30. So it's going to be 15 plus a little bit, plus a little bit, plus a little bit to get to 30. You did that with the first segment, but it was the values from the yeah, because remember, it was still, x equals zero was still right there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is everybody okay with that? That's a good question. Or B, uh, 65 plus 63. All right. Let's, let's go through this pretty quick. So say it again. 65 plus 63. And that's positive? Yes. Okay, and what about MC? Somebody else got that? Two oh three point nine. One. I was 
So if I go up to my moment diagram, I'm essentially talking about like that value, that value, and that value. What's M max going to be for this segment? There we go. Take absolute values for everything. What are we getting for C sub B? Two point oh five. Got a second on that? Yes. All right. There you go. Exactly right. So this segment has a C sub B of two point zero five. So in a weird way. Theoretically, what's the strongest segment, A, B, B, C, or C, D? C, D, right? Now, because I heard you argue. All right, does this make sense? I'm telling you, it's probably worth it to spend a whole day on just C, C, B. Next time, what we're going to do is we're going to break this down and actually look at the capacity. I know we can What? Okay, that's all I have, everybody. You all have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you on Monday. I'm going to...